Welcome. A few lectures ago, we discussed Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarfs and his sensational discovery that there are no equilibrium configurations of white dwarfs which are supported against gravity by the quantum mechanical degeneracy pressure of the electrons if their mass exceeds 1.4 times the mass of the sun. In a similar fashion, one can ask, is there a limiting mass for neutron stars, which are presumably supported against gravity by the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons? This is what we shall discuss in today's lecture. First, let us go and recall the notion of neutron star itself and when it originated. It was Lev Landau in Moscow in the year 1938 conjectured the formation of neutron stars at the cores of stars. The basis for his statement was an earlier discovery by Hund in 1936 that there could be situations when ordinary matter, which consists of protons and neutrons and electrons, will convert itself to neutron matter with all the electrons combining with all the protons to form neutrons. The difficulty with this idea was that the reaction that protons will combine with electrons to form a neutron and a neutrino, which will of course escape, is strongly endothermic, which means this will not happen spontaneously and you have to supply energy for this reaction to happen. And you have to supply an enormous amount of energy. For example, if you try to convert one gram of ordinary matter to neutrons, then it will cost you 7 times 10 to the power 18 ergs, which is an enormous amount of energy. But Landau had this brilliant idea that if you are dealing with massive stars, then the gravitational binding energy of such massive stars, which is minus g m squared divided by r, can be so large that it can supply the required energy to convert ordinary matter to neutron matter. So let's try to say this pictorially. Landau's idea was that a star consists of what he called as electronic matter, which consists of protons and neutrons and electrons. His idea was that when the density of matter exceeds 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter, if you remember our discussion in the earlier lecture when we went on a journey to the center of the neutron star, we said above a density of 4.3 times 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter, matter will get neutronized. In other words, protons will combine with electrons to form neutrons. And Landau's idea was that the energy that is needed for this reaction to happen can be obtained if this star were to collapse from a very large radius to a radius of mere 10 kilometers. And by that time, what you will be left with is matter which consists entirely of neutrons, neutron matter, and whose density will be of the order of 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter, which is the density of atomic nuclei on Earth. So this was the brilliant idea of Landau. Now we go back to the year 1938, soon after Landau's paper. Robert Oppenheimer, a brilliant theoretical physicist working at the University of California in Berkeley, and also at the California Institute of Technology asked, 
would there be a maximum mass for a neutron star? Now, every time a famous professor wants to do an investigation, the first thing he does is to get a smart student. And Oppenheimer had a galaxy of brilliant student clustering around him because he was well known as a brilliant teacher. And the student who cho he chose for this investigation was Volkov. And his job was to find the maximum mass of neutron stars by following along the same lines that Chandrasekhar did to find the maximum mass of white dwarfs with two important differences. The first difference is obvious, namely, this time, it is not the pressure of the electrons which is going to support a neutron star because the electrons are all gone. They have combined with protons to form neutrons. So if you compress a neutron, neutron matter, then the pressure that will oppose this compression is the degeneracy pressure of the neutron gas instead of the electron gas. And they said, we will calculate this pressure using the formula that Chandrasekhar had derived earlier, eight years earlier, for degenerate electron gas. There is essentially no difference between a degenerate electron gas and a degenerate neutron gas, except for the mass of the elementary particle, which can be taken into account very easily. The second difference is the following. Chandrasekhar assumed that a white dwarf can be described within the premises of Newtonian gravity. A white dwarf of a solar mass has a rather large radius of about 10,000 kilometers. And with that radius, the gravity is not strong enough to warrant any deviation from Newtonian gravity. But when you are dealing with a neutron star whose radius is not 10,000 kilometers but a mere 10 kilometers, then gravity is much, much stronger. And therefore, Oppenheimer concluded that one must describe the gravity in a neutron star using Einstein's general theory of relativity and not Newtonian theory of gravity. Now, if you remember, Chandrasekhar's remarkable discovery was the following. A fully relativistic white dwarf, namely with all the electrons moving very nearly at the speed of light, when the energy of the electron is equal to P times C, where P is the momentum of the electron, has a unique mass but no radius. And that unique mass is is given purely by a combination of fundamental constants that appear in the theory. And there is a 1 over mu squared in the denominator, or mu squared in the denominator, and that mu, if you recall, is the mean molecular weight per electron. What this means is that mu e times mp, where mp is the mass of the proton, is really the mass per electron. Now, why do we have to introduce this notion of mean molecular weight? Because if you leave out hydrogen in the periodic table, for all other elements in the periodic table, for every electron in the shell around the nucleus, there are two particles in the, nuclei, in the nucleus, a proton and a neutron, because the ratio of proton to neutron is roughly the same, one is to one, for the entire periodic table except for hydrogen. Therefore, you have to calculate the mass per electron. You have to multiply the mass of the proton by 2. And that 2 is the mean molecular weight. Now, for a neutron gas, mu is 1. Because it can, you are talking of a matter which is entirely neutrons. Therefore, every particle contributes to gravity and every particle contributes to degeneracy pressure. Therefore, mu is simply 1. Therefore, if I set mu equal to 1, I will get a value, if I had taken all the other decimal places into account, of 5.76 solar mass. In other words, Oppenheimer and Volkov knew instantly that in Newtonian gravity, the Chandrasekhar limiting mass for a neutron star 
will be 5.7 times or 7.6 times the solar mass, which is just four times the limiting mass of white dwarf. Now, what do I mean by saying Chandrasekhar limiting mass? I mean that if a neutron star were to become ultra relativistic, namely all the neutrons are moving at the speeds close to the light, then its radius will be zero and its mass will be 5.76 solar mass. But this is in Newtonian gravity. As I said, Oppenheimer had told Volkov, you must do the calculation within Einstein's general theory of relativity. And how do you do that? You do the same thing. Namely, you integrate the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium. If you remember, the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, equilibrium is dp by dr is minus g m rho divided by r square, where p will be the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons in Chandrasekhar's theory, it was the degeneracy pressure of the electrons. But the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium in general relativity reads very differently from the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium in Newtonian mechanics. There are three additional terms which I have marked in, in green. Let's look at the term in the denominator. That, if you remember, is merely the curvature of space. Because in general relativity, mass curves space. And that is the curvature distortion of space due to massive body or due to the geometry no longer being Euclidean. So that's straightforward. Now let's look at these two terms. Where do they come from? Here you have the mass. Please remember that in general relativity, all forms of energy contribute to mass, just as special relativity tells you to do so. So if you have kinetic energy, if you have potential energy, if you have pressure, all of them contribute to mass. Why will pressure contribute to mass? Pressure is nothing but energy density, energy per unit volume. So if I divide that by c squared, then I will get uh, the energy, all right? I, I, I'll get a mass, rather, excuse me. Pressure is energy density, energy per volume. So if I divide energy density by C squared, I will get the mass density. So I have to add here this term. Please think about it. It is 4 pi r cube multiplied by the pressure at the point r divided by c squared. And similarly, rho of r is mass density, where in Newtonian mechanics, gravity, you take into account only the rest mass energy of the particles. But if there is pressure, there is energy density, therefore that divided by c squared will give you mass density. Right? Therefore, these two terms are corrections in general relativity to the Newtonian equation of hydrostatic equilibrium. And this equation is known as tolman oppenheimer volkoff equation. Tolman was a very distinguished theoretical physicist also at the California Institute of Technology. Now, this equation, if I set c equal to infinity, all the green terms disappear and you will get the Newtonian equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, namely dp by dr is minus gm rho over r squared. So that's all Volkov, young Volkov had to do is to, instead of integrating this differential equation with the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons, you integrate that differential equation with the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons. And when he did that, exactly as Chandrasekhar did, they found a maximum mass. And one more thing, I already said this, for the pressure of the neutron gas, they assume the same formula that Chandrasekhar had derived for the electrons, except that you have to change the mass in the pressure 
from electron mass to neutron mass. Therefore, the pressure for a given density will be 2,000 times less because 2,000 times greater mass comes in the denominator. But otherwise, they use the same formula that Chandrasekhar had derived earlier and we, which we discussed at great length. For a non-relativistic gas, the degeneracy pressure is proportional to density to the power 5 by 3. Now, what they found was uh, the following. What is plotted here on the y-axis is the mass of neutron stars in units of the mass of the sun. What is plotted on the x-axis is the central density in grams per cubic centimeter. So here in green is the branch of stable white dwarfs. And this is the maximum mass for the white dwarf, which is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Please excuse me that this graph doesn't really come to 1.4, but I have difficulties in making these graphs in PowerPoint to make it that precise. But you know what I mean, this maximum mass is 1.4 times the solar mass. What Oppenheimer and Volkov found when they integrated the general relativistic equation of hydrostatic equilibrium was this curve. And they knew very well that it's only this branch which consists of stable neutron stars. So once again, the stable neutron star does not have a minimum mass just as in Chandrasekhar's theory, there was no minimum mass for a neutron star. There was only a maximum mass. Here also there is a maximum mass. And the question is, what was the maximum mass that young Volkov found? That maximum mass that he found was 0 0.7 times the mass of the sun. So you will find that rather surprising because in Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarf for it was 1.4 solar mass. If you had used Newtonian gravity, we found the maximum mass should be 5.76 solar mass, but he found a mass of 0.7 solar mass. In other words, by the time the mass of the neutron star grows to 0.7 solar mass, it can no longer uh, be supported against gravity by the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons. Why is that? That is because, in general relativity, gravity is stronger than in Newtonian theory. Why is gravity stronger in general relativity? Because in Newtonian theory, it's only the rest mass of the particles that contribute to gravity. Whereas in general relativity, all forms of energy and pressure contribute to gravity. Therefore, for the same baryonic mass or the same rest mass of the particles, the effective mass in general relativity is greater because all forms of energy divided by c squared is a mass and therefore gravity overwhelms the star at a much smaller mass of 0 0.7 solar mass than it did uh, in the case of a white dwarf. What they found was that the radius of a neutron star at the maximum mass was not zero, like the radius of a white dwarf was zero at the Chandrasekhar limiting mass, but it was 10 kilometers. Why is this so? At the limiting mass of a white dwarf, the electrons were ultra-relativistic. But when the maximum mass of a neutron star is reached in general relativity at a mass of 0 0.7 solar mass, the neutrons are only mildly relativistic. So you're not talking about an ultra-relativistic neutron star. If you could have an ultra-relativistic neutron star, then its limiting mass will be 5.76 solar mass uh, in Newtonian gravity. But in general relativity, this is the limiting mass that you get, and you get a finite radius. Let me repeat, the finite radius is because the neutron star is not fully relativistic at this mass. The central density of a neutron star of maximum mass is about 5 times 10 to the power 15 grams per cubic centimeter. So it's almost 15 times the nuclear density. 
so it's extremely dense. Now, let us, uh, one picture is worth 10,000 words, so let's repeat. So in Newtonian gravity, if you insisted on calculating the limiting mass of a neutron star in Newtonian gravity, the, new, the limiting mass will be obtained when the neutrons become ultra-relativistic. The mass of the uh, limiting mass will be 5.76 solar mass, and the radius of the neutron star will be zero. But we are not dealing with Newtonian gravity. It would be wrong to use Newtonian gravity for a neutron star. In general relativity, what Oppenheimer and Volkov found is that the limiting mass was 0 0.7 solar mass. Now, to repeat, the Oppenheimer-Volkov mass is much smaller than the Chandrasekhar limiting mass of 5.76 or 5.73 solar mass. This is because gravity is stronger in general relativity. The radius of the neutron star of this mass will be about 10 kilometers or not zero. This is because at the maximum mass of the sequence of neutron stars of different masses, the neutrons are only mildly relativistic, but not ultra relativistic as in the case of white dwarf with a limiting mass. Well, Oppenheimer and Volkov Although they found a limiting mass of 0.7 solar mass, Oppenheimer knew that this result cannot be quite right quantitatively. He knew the following. He knew already in 1938, even though nuclear physics was a very primitive subject at that time, that at very high densities, like five times 10 to the power 15 grams per cubic centimeter, which is 10 times the nuclear density, density of atomic nuclei, the neutrons will be squeezed against one another and they will repel one another because that's the nature of the nuclear force. And that repulsion is going to help you against gravity. So far, all you took into account while supporting against gravity was the degeneracy pressure arising from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Pauli's principle. There is a friend you have now supplying extra pressure, which is the repulsion between two neutrons being squeezed against one another due to the repulsive nuclear force. So Oppenheimer conjectured rightly that this repulsion should amount to something. And so he conjectured that the limiting mass will not be 0.7 solar mass in general relativity, if you did your nuclear physics correctly, which they couldn't in 1938, he conjectured that the limiting mass in general relativity would be a few solar masses. Why? First, let us discuss the ideal Fermi gas. You, have, you should have asked the following question to yourself when I discussed Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarf. Chandrasekhar assumed the electrons are an ideal gas which doesn't obey Boyle's law, but which obeys Fermi-Dirac law. And from that, we derived a degeneracy pressure, which is proportional to density to the power 5 by 3 or 4 by 3 if the electrons were relativistic. But was Chandrasekhar making a serious mistake in assuming that the electrons formed an ideal Fermi gas? What does ideal mean? Ideal means that the kinetic energy of the particles is far greater than the interparticle potential energy. Now we know that even in ordinary metals on Earth, whose density is only a few grams per cubic centimeter, the electron-electron Coulomb interaction is important. If it were not important, interesting phenomena like magnetism or superconductivity will not happen. So we know that the interaction between electrons is important already at a density of a few grams per cubic centimeter. But we assume that in a metal, electrons form an ideal gas. 
and we said EF is much greater than KT, but we ignored the interaction between the electrons. But that's only few grams per cubic centimeter. The interaction energy between electrons is probably not that serious. But here you're dealing with the matter not at few grams per cubic centimeter density, but a million grams per cubic centimeter density. Now, under those extreme conditions, can you still regard the Fermi gas as being an ideal gas? Is this a valid assumption? Let's examine this. So, to repeat, after all, electron-electron interaction is important even in terrestrial metal. Now, can you assume this? So, let us now discuss this. So, here are two electrons in an electron gas. And let's draw an imaginary sphere around it, an imaginary sphere around it, so that these spheres are touching. What is the significance of this imaginary sphere whose radius is R0? It is the following. 4 pi by 3 R0 cube, which is the volume of the cylinder, I mean the sphere, multiplied by the number of electrons per unit volume is just 1. In other words, there is only one electron inside that sphere. There is one electron inside that sphere. So all I'm saying is, if I give you a box with electrons whose density is n electrons per cubic centimeter, then their mean distance between them is of the order of R0. Well, 2 R0, but we'll, we'll ignore the 2 R0, where R0 is defined by this equation. So from this equation, you see that the mean distance between the electrons at a density n is proportional to density to the power minus 1 by 3. I just take this term to the right-hand side in the denominator. So keep that in mind. If I have an electron gas with a density n per cubic centimeter, n electrons per cubic centimeter, the mean distance between the electron is proportional to, inversely proportional to density to the power 1 by 3. Now, I mean, keeping that in mind, let us ask, how does the kinetic energy of the electron depend on the interparticle distance or the density? We know, we have discussed this at nauseam, the kinetic energy is typically the Fermi energy is proportional to density to the power 2 by 3. What about the potential energy? The potential energy between two electrons is E squared over R0. R0 scales as density to the power minus 1 by 3. Therefore, 1 by R0 scales as density to the power 1 by 3. So look at this difference. The kinetic energy scales as n to the power 2 by 3. The potential energy scales as n to the power 1 by 3. Therefore, as I increase n, the kinetic energy increases much faster than the potential energy due to Coulomb interaction. Therefore, the electron gas has a peculiar property, a very peculiar property, that as its density increases, it becomes more and more ideal. This is why you could ignore electron-electron interaction in metals while discussing the statistical properties of the electron gas. And in a white dwarf whose density is million times greater, the potential energy of interaction between electrons is utterly uh, insignificant compared to the kinetic energy. Therefore, the kinetic energy is much greater than the potential energy. But this is not true of the neutron gas because two neutrons do not interact via Coulomb potential. Two protons at that distance do not interact via Coulomb potential. They interact via the nuclear potential, which we know experimentally is given by this curve. What is plotted on the y-axis is the potential energy. Above the x-axis, it is repulsive. Below the x-axis, it is attractive. So at an intraparticle distance, the nuclear potential energy is strongly attractive. But if I squeeze two protons or two neutrons against one another, the force is strongly repulsive, strongly repulsive. 
This is true not just of nuclear force. This is true even for Van der Waal forces, the forces between two atoms with electronic shells and the forces bet force between two molecules. In, in, in none of those cases, uh, you have a potential energy which goes as 1 over uh, n to the power, uh, uh, sorry, the mean distance of pa between particle going as 1 over n to the power 1 by 3. Therefore, if you take this potential energy curve, uh, what Oppenheimer and Wolk, what Oppenheimer said, conjecture, is uh, that if you if you add to the degeneracy pressure of the electron, the pressure due to this repulsive energy, remember energy density is pressure, then uh, you see at short distances this repulsion is very strong. This repulsion will help to support the star. The details of the nuclear potential were not yet known in 1938. The potential energy curve is obtained by shooting nucleons into nuclei or shooting two nucleons against one another. That's why accelerators are built. So nevertheless, Oppenheimer was brave enough to conjecture that the nuclear repulsion would increase the maximum mass to a few solar mass. Therefore, he concluded that yes, there is a maximum mass for the neutron star. It's not on point for solar mass or 5.76 solar mass. In general relativity, it is 0.7 solar mass, but if you read your nuclear physics properly, then it would probably be a few times the mass of the sun, and they couldn't say how many times the mass of the sun. Now, before we proceed, let us ask the interesting question. If you look at the figure that I showed earlier, there were mass versus central density. There were two branches of stable stars. One was the white dwarf with the, uh, in green with a maximum mass of 1.4 solar mass. One was the stable branch of neutron stars with a maximum mass of 0 0.7 solar mass with some uncertainty. Why are there only two kinds of cold stars? What do I mean by cold stars? Stars at absolute zero of temperature, stars which are not generating energy, stars in which gravity is supported only by the pressure of the gas, classical or quantum mechanical. Okay, Why are there only two kinds of cold stars, white dwarfs and neutron stars? Why no other kind of stars? After all, so many different kinds of elementary particles are being discovered. And every time elementary particle is discovered, the person gets a Nobel Prize. So why not just ele electron stars and neutron stars? Why not stars with pi mesons, k mesons, mu mesons, or what have you? So let's try to understand this. This has to do with stability of matter. You have to ask the following quest fundamental question. What is the condition that matter, a chunk of matter, will be stable? The condition is the following, and it's a very simple condition. If I squeeze the matter, it should cost me energy to squeeze it. If I squeeze the matter, and it doesn't cost me any energy to squeeze it, then I can go on squeezing it at zero cost, and matter will be unstable. So the question really is, what is the condition that the compressibility of matter, compressibility of matter is positive? If the compressibility of matter is negative, matter will be unstable. Now, if you examine this problem properly, then you can derive the following very simple condition which I shall not take the time to establish in this lecture. For a star to be stable, I mean the following, I compress the star, either gravity is compressing it or I externally compress it in a vice. For the star to be stable, it must, the compressibility should be positive. And the condition is gamma, the ratio of the specific heat at constant pressure to constant volume should be greater than 4 by 3. For an ideal gas, the compressibility, uh, sorry, the, 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 the ratio of specific heat gamma is 5 by 3. 
which is larger than 4 by 3. But if the gamma of matter becomes 4 by 3 or less than 4 by 3, then matter will become unstable. If gamma is less than 4 by 3, the compressibility of matter will be negative. In other words, it will cost me negative energy to compress the matter. Another way of saying that is matter will spontaneously collapse. Since pressure varies over the star, the relevant parameter is not some fixed number gamma, because gamma depends on the pressure, and the pressure varies from the surface to the center of the star, so you take some average of the gamma. So the statement is the average value of gamma over the star must be greater than 4 by 3 in order for the star to be stable against compression. Now, how do you calculate this factor gamma, the ratio of specific heat? If you have an equation of state, pressure as a function of density, then you can calculate this gamma using thermodynamic relation because gamma is simply the ratio of specific heat at constant pressure to constant volume. Now, here is the plot of gamma as a function of density. Gamma on the y-axis and the logarithm of density on the x-axis. This is the result of an honest calculation because people have calculated the equation of state pressure as a function of density all the way from the surface of the neutron star through neutron drip density to nuclear density, as I explained in the previous lecture when we went on a journey to the center of a neutron star. Using those equations of state, and I showed graphs of them, people have cal physicists have calculated gamma as a function of density. And what you find is that this green portion, when the density is in this range or the density is in that range, matter is stable. But if the density is in this range, between this density and this density, gamma is less than 4 by 3, which is the horizontal dashed line, and matter is unstable. Matter is unstable. What has this got to do with the price of fish? What has this got to do with the question that I asked? Namely, why are there only two kinds of cold stars, white dwarfs and neutron stars? Now here is the plot of the mass versus central density once again. I showed this part of this a few slides ago. This is Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarfs, the stable branch with a limiting mass of one point for solar mass. This is Oppenheimer and Volkov's calculation of uh, the equation of state of a, a general relativistic neutron star supported by degeneracy pressure of neutrons. But at intermediate densities, neither Chandrasekhar nor Oppenheimer and Volkov had anything to say about uh, the equation of state. Now, this was calculated by Harrison and Wheeler with improvements suggested by Sal Peter, Bethe, Bame, and Pethik, and so on, which I referred to in the previous lecture. And that is this yellow curve over there. So this is the full mass versus central density curve now. Now, let us ask, which portion of this curve is stable and which portion of this curve is unstable? In this region, gamma is less than 4 by 3. In this region, gamma is less than 4 by 3. Therefore, stars, if you were to form them with any particle that you like, would be unstable. Here also, stars would be unstable. That is why there are only two branches of neutron, uh, uh, white dwarfs and neutron stars with no stable configuration in between. So this is the answer to the question. Uh, why there are only two types of cold stars, 
namely white dwarfs and neutron stars and nothing in between. What about here? That we will discuss pretty soon will be black holes. Now, before proceeding, let us ask a naughty question. We said this is roughly the structure of a neutron star. There's a solid crust with some subtle variations. There is an upper crust and a lower crust in which there, are new, there is a neutron fluid and so on. But let's forget about all those details. The important thing is at a density greater than 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter, you have a fluid core which consists of 95% of neutrons and 5% of protons. Now, you can ask the following naughty question, namely, why don't these neutrons decay? Why don't the neutrons decay to a proton, electron, and an antineutrino? Probably if I put a neutron on the top of your table, after a thousand seconds or so, it will probably decay to a proton, electron, and emit an antineutrino. So why don't all these neutrons decay? In other words, why is a neutron star stable? Now here is the answer to that question. If a neutron in the core of the neutron star were to decay, then, and produce a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino, then this electron must have some real estate to go and sit some real estate in energy space to go and sit. What is plotted here is the energy bucket of the electrons. This consists of discrete levels. All those energies are occupied up to this energy, and this is the Fermi energy, whose numerical value is proportional to density to the power 2 by 3 multiplied by constants, which I wrote for you before. Therefore, if a neutron were to decay in the core of the neutron star, then this electron would have to climb and sit over there. Because that's the only energy level which is vacant. Of course, all the levels above it are vacant, but that will cost even more energy. So you have a skyscraper building, all the floors up to 47th floor are occupied, so a new tenant can only occupy the 48th floor or the 49th floor or the 50th floor, but minimum 48th floor. But this means that this electron must have an enormous amount of energy to go and sit on top of the Fermi C. Now the only available state for the electron is top of the Fermi C. And wh why can't this electron go and sit over there? That is because this Fermi energy is many millions of electron volts in value. That is because the electron density is enormous. Even though the electrons are only 5% of the protons, the density is 2.4 times, 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. Therefore, the, 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 the Fermi energy of the electrons will be many millions of electron volts. And this doesn't have that energy to go. That is why a neutron star is stable. A neutron, the neutron radioactive decay of the neutron is inhibited by the fact that the offspring electron does not have energy to climb to the top of the Fermi C and sit there because that's the only energy level which is vacant. Everything else is occupied. Therefore, that process is forbidden and that's why a neutron star is stable. Now, let us ask, why is there a minimum mass for the electron? You notice that the moment I applied this equation of state in the middle, although Oppenheimer and Volkov's theory did not say that there is a minimum mass for a neutron star, if I take a proper theory, then I find the minimum mass is over there corresponding to that central density. So why is there a minimum mass? Why is there a minimum mass? Well, the reason is very simple. This is the slide that I showed you before. A neutron star is stable 
because the neutron in the core cannot decay because the electron cannot climb to the top of the Fermi C and sit there. But suppose I decrease the mass of the neutron star. Remember the mass radius relation for a neutron star will be the same as Chandrasekhar's mass versus radius relation that of our white dwarfs. Namely, the radius of the white dwarf will be inversely proportional to the cube root of the mass. More massive the neutron star, smaller the radius. Smaller the mass of the neutron star, larger is the radius. Also remember that the mean density is proportional to the square of the mass. Therefore, if I go to neutron stars of smaller and smaller masses in the sequence, the mean density will be smaller and smaller. Therefore, so all this remains so. So as the mass of the neutron star decreases, The mass of a given neutron star doesn't decrease. What I mean is, if you have a sequence of neutron stars of different masses, then if I go to neutron stars of smaller and smaller masses, the mean density decreases and the Fermi energy decreases. So whereas the Fermi energy for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star was many millions of electron volts over there, when the density, mean density of the neutron star decreases, the Fermi energy will come down and this electron can now go and sit over there and therefore this process is now allowed. Therefore, as I decrease the mass of the neutron star or as I go to neutron stars of smaller and smaller masses, you will reach a critical mass when the neutrons will no longer be stable and the neutron star will once again become a white dwarf. That is why there is a minimum mass per neutron star. Now, if you use the best equation of state that's available today and calculate the average value of gamma, the ratio of specific heat, and set that gamma is equal to 4 by 3, you get a minimum mass of around 0 0.1 solar mass. In other words, you cannot have a neutron star whose mass is less than 0 0.1 solar mass. Its radius will be quite big, 160 kilometers, and its density will still be significant, comparable to nuclear density. This is why there are only two branches of stable neutron stars. There is nothing in the middle because gamma is less than 4 by 3, and the neutron star itself cannot decay back to a white dwarf. Now, let us ask the following question. Oppenheimer could not estimate what would be the real limiting mass of a neutron star in general relativity because at that time the nuclear physics at very high densities was not understood. But one can ask the following question. Can we say something absolute? For example, we can say that the velocity of a particle can never exceed the speed of light. So can we say something of that degree of rigor. We can. The stiffest equation of state will give a limiting mass. Stiffest equation of state meaning the one which gives the largest pressure for a given density will give me the limiting mass. Now, let us ask, what are the constraints on the equation of state? What are the constraints on any equation of state? Equation of state is the relation between pressure and density. Matter has to be stable, microscopic stability. That requires dp by d rho must be greater than or equal to zero. This is the condition of microscopic stability. Okay, dp by d rho cannot be less than zero. If I increase the density, pressure cannot decrease. The second is causality condition dp by d rho should be less than the square of the speed of light because as you know, if you remember your thermodynamics, dp by d rho is the square of the speed of sound. dp by d rho is the square of the speed of sound. 
So what we are saying by this causality condition is that the speed of sound can never exceed the speed of light. Now, you know that sound travels faster inside the earth than in the air. That is how seismic quakes are detected first through the ground than through the air. Now, as I increase the density of matter, the speed of sound increases. Matter is stiffer and the speed of sound increases. All we are saying is, you cannot have matter so stiff that the speed of sound exceeds the speed of light. That is the causality condition. So this condition, these two conditions have to be satisfied, absolutely satisfied by any equation of state with which you will construct model neutron stars. So now, why am I saying this? Here is a neutron star in the green region this is not to scale, okay? This, 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 this magenta region is the region where we have very little knowledge. This is a region of such high density that experimentally we do not have a correct value of the inter-nuclear potential energy to calculate the pressure reliably. That region is not going to be such a large fraction of the neutron star. That will be a small fraction. But to make this figure um, uh, easier for you to visualize, I made this magenta region very strong, very, very large. So up to this density, rho m, in the green region, I have very reliable equation of state, very reliable equation of state, because I can believe in the physics, because the input comes from sound experimental data. But over here, I do not have sound experimental data. That's why people are building the large hadron colliders and so on to collide nuclei at extremely large energy to calculate the internuclear potential energy and therefore the pressure at very high density. But pending the results of these large hadron collider results, we can certainly make the following assumption that the pressure will be proportional to rho c squared. It cannot be stiffer than rho c squared because if you did that, then you will come to the absurd conclusion that the speed of sound is greater than the speed of light. So if you construct such a model neutron star, be modest and say, look, I don't know anything about this magenta region. All I know is that it cannot be stiffer than this. Then what is the maximum mass that I get? Hartle and his collaborators Hartle is the most distinguished physicist. They calculated many years ago that the maximum mass of a neutron star cannot be in excess of 4.8 solar mass. They are not saying it will be as high as 4.8 solar mass. They are saying it cannot be greater than 4.8 solar mass. Because if it did, then you will run into absurdities like speed of sound uh, being greater than the speed of um, uh, light. The second thing we have ignored in all this is the rotation of the neutron star. Neutron stars rotate, pulsars rotate. Some of them rotate 642 times a second, the millisecond pulsar. So the centrifugal force is quite significant. And that will also contribute to supporting against gravity. So you can ask, what is the maximum mass for a neutron star if it was rotating maximally? And that was calculated by John Friedman a most distinguished uh, former student of Chandrasekhar uh, and his collaborators, and they calculated the maximum mass of a uniformly rotating neutron star cannot be in excess of 6.1 solar mass. So let me stress, these are not saying that in effect, the maximum mass can be as large as 6 solar mass. They're only saying that it cannot be greater than that. Now, people have tried to calculate by improving the equation of state at densities greater than the nuclear density using collider result for the past 30 years. Very smart people, large number of teams around the world have calculated. And what they have concluded is that the maximum value of the mass of the neutron star with the very best equation of state that you can calculate at present is around two times the mass of the sun. Okay, so let us therefore summarize. 
according to general relativity if neutron pressure alone was taken into account the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons alone was taken into account open and openheimer and volkov concluded that the maximum mass of a neutron star will be 0.7 solar but this couldn't be right you have to take into account the nuclear repulsion contributing and therefore supporting against gravity all i'm saying is after 30 years in fact 30 years in recent times going back to 1938 we are talking about after 80 years after 90 years after oppenheimer and volkov's paper all we are able to say is that the maximum mass of a neutron star is only of the order of two times the mass of the sun in 1938 oppenheimer and volkov showed that there is a maximum mass for a neutron star what will be the ultimate fate of very massive stars which cannot end up either as white dwarfs or neutron stars so what is this this question mark this was the question raised by oppenheimer and volkov in 1938 In a sense, that question had been answered already six years earlier by Chandrasekhar in his famous paper of 1932, and I referred to this paper before. For all stars of mass greater than a critical mass, the perfect gas equation of state does not break down, however high the density may become, and the matter does not become degenerate. An appeal to Fermi-Dirac statistics to avoid the central singularity cannot. be made therefore chandrasekhar's answer was that for all stars above a critical mass matter will remain classical because the radiation pressure will always be greater than 9.2% of the total pressure and a collapse to singularity cannot be avoided in 1939 Oppenheimer probably was not aware of this paper by Chandrasekhar published in a German journal in 1932 he asked another student whose name was Hartland Schneider to rigorously study the collapse of a massive star within the framework of general relativity Now this student was a very special student Hartland Schneider drove trucks giant american trucks one day he decided i don't want to drive trucks anymore i want to do theoretical physics so he he asked some friends around saying tell me the names of some really smart physicists i can go and study with and do some research in physics so he ended up in berkeley in california and went to work with oppenheimer now oppenheimer wanted to do this problem collapse of a star in general relativity and this is a very tricky problem so he wanted a person a student who was good in mathematics but more importantly was very careful with mathematics because general relativity in general relativity you are dealing with very complex differential equations He told Hartland Schneider, "Look, your problem is hard enough, so I am going to allow you to make some simplifying assumption. Assume that you are dealing with a spherical star, which is not rotating. Stars do rotate, therefore they are not strictly spherical." He also said, "You assume that there is no internal energy generation or internal pressure in the star, which is going to com- complicate matters. But apart from making this assumption," you cannot make any other assumption mathematically you must solve this problem mathematically exactly within the premise of general relativity and hartland schneider did that within a remarkably short time of just a year and a half and this is what oppenheimer and schneider found in 1939 they found a very perplexing result a distant astronomer would see the following as the star collapses and collapses and collapses and reaches the critical radius which we shall discuss in the next lecture whose value is 2 gm divided by c square which is the radius at which it will become a black hole 
So as the star collapses and collapses and collapses and reaches the critical radius, its shrinking becomes slower and slower and slower and slower till it becomes frozen precisely at the critical radius. Therefore, an observer at infinity never finds the star ever becoming as small as the critical radius. So collapse slows down, slows down, slows down, slows down. But an astronomer sitting on the collapsing star finds exactly the opposite. He finds that as the collapse proceeds, implosion doesn't freeze or any such thing. The implosion proceeds faster and faster and faster. And before you know, it has reached the critical radius. So you have exactly contrary description of the same event by two different observers, a co-moving observer and an observer at infinity. So this is what they said in the final paragraph of their paper. When all thermonuclear force sources of energy are exhausted, a sufficiently massive star will collapse. The radius of the star approaches asymptotically its gravitational radius. Light from the surface of the star is progressively reddened and can escape over a progressively narrower and narrower range of angles. The star thus tends to close itself off from any communication with the distant observer. Only its gravitational field persists. So they concluded in 1939, Oppenheimer and Schneider, that stars with mass greater than a critical mass, which cannot end up either as white dwarfs or neutron stars, will have no option but to become black holes. On the day this remarkable paper of Oppenheimer and Schneider appeared in the prestigious journal Physical Review, World War II broke out. Physics came to a halt for six years. Physicists all around the world, the good guys and the bad guys, joined in war effort. Oppenheimer went on to lead the team that built the atom bomb in Los Alamos and that was dropped over Hiroshima on 6th of August, 1945. Black holes and all these remarkable predictions by Oppenheimer and Snyder were forgotten. Till 1964. Meanwhile, in April 1955, Einstein died. In the next lecture, we shall pursue the story. We will pursue the story of black holes of general relativity. Thank you for your attention.